really, there is only love, right? So I have everything to say and nothing to say. <laughs> love is one of those words that just has so many different facets, right? It's like a diamond. You can just keep turning it and turning it and catching different lights and different ways that love shows up for us. What is this thing we call love? It's synonymous with God. It's synonymous with, you know, it's that sense of divine love. And then, of course, we think of it as romantic love and euros and then agape love, love for God or love of God. And there's so many different ways of understanding it as compassion and forgiveness and, and kindness and solidarity. And what else? What other ways do you think of love? Anybody? Friends, yeah. Selfless giving. Caring, unity. forgiveness, unity, yeah. Light. We know all about love. I have nothing to share, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I find sometimes that love shows up best for us, actually, most poignantly, most acutely, and maybe this is true on the spiritual path of most things, during the tough times. Did you ever notice that? It's when life gets rough, when we have challenges, when we are, are kind of back against the wall even kind of situations, that love is what, what sort of saves us. Love is the redeeming factor. Love is the thing that we draw forth and draw upon and brings forth the healing and the liberation. Bob May had a situation where he was very, feeling very, very desperate. And it was uh, 1938, and he was sitting in his apartment in Chicago. Now he had moved to the Chicago slums, essentially. And he had his little daughter, Barbara, four years old, on his lap, and they both were crying. And they were crying because his wife and her mother, Evelyn, was dying of cancer in the hospital. They'd gone through all their life savings during that time that she had been ill, and he didn't really know what to say to his daughter, you know? What do you say to a four-year-old? Mommy's not coming home. And she said, why can't she be like the other mommies? And this cut him to the core, because that had been his core issue of not being like anyone else, of always being the outcast, of always being the one who was, as a child, made fun of, a slight boy. He couldn't play sports, and he was called all kinds of names. He was bullied all through school. And so he always felt on the outside. And this was one last kind of moment of that most poignant in his grief. And so he was looking at Barbara and he was thinking about this child and what he didn't have money to give her a gift for Christmas. And here they are both so sad. He wants to bring some joy into their lives. And he's thinking about what could he give? And, you know, he had actually had some fortunate things happen in his life. He got a job as a copywriter at Montgomery Ward's, the department store, during the Great Depression. He met Evelyn, who was the love of his life, and they brought forth this beautiful child. And even though their recent years and their time with Barbara had been racked by the illness and the financial challenges, he had this gift of a girl sitting on his lap. So he thought, what could I do for her for Christmas, I, you know, without buying something? And he thought, I know, I'll, I'll write her a story. I'll make her a storybook. And so he began to tell her the story, and every time he told it, he embellished it a little bit more, and he tweaked it a little bit more. He watched how she reacted, and he tried on different things. And by Christmas, he had written the storybook and gifted it to his daughter. Somehow the manager at Ward's got caught wind of the fact that he had written the storybook and asked if they could buy, with a nominal fee, the rights to the book so that they could have uh, Santa Claus handed out when the kids came to visit Santa. And so he said, sure, no problem, and he sold over the rights. And from 1938 to 1946, Montgomery Wards gave away six million copies of the book. They had a real opportunity there. This was basically, in, in fable form, Bob's autobiography. And so then they were approached in 1946, the store was, with the, um, a publisher who wanted to reprint it and make a new edition and wanted to buy the rights. And obviously it was successful, so this was going to be a lot of money in this negotiation. And in an unprecedented act of kindness and generosity and integrity, the CEO of Montgomery Wards turned to Bob May and gave him the rights back. And Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> 
became this amazing story that we all love and know, right? And the story doesn't even end there. Bob got remarried. He was, had a growing family. He became a wealthy man because of all of this. And his brother-in-law made a song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you might know it. <laughs> and they went to some pretty popular singers like Bing Crosby and Dinah Shore, and they said, nah, I'll pass. So Jean Autry is the one who, the singing cowboy, who said yes to the song. And you know that it rose to be the, almost the best-selling Christmas song ever. It was only second to White Christmas. You know, and the toy deals came in, the marketing deals, even in 1946. <laughs> but what, what did that all get born out of? You know, a man in pain, a man in grief, a man in a very, very difficult situation. And when we find ourselves in those very, very desperate, grief-stricken, difficult situations, it's out of that that we call forth the power of divine love. And through it comes, it comes through us as creativity, as abundance, and it multiplies and blesses over and over again so that the CEO comes in with this unprecedented act of generosity and kindness. You know, sometimes I think some of us think that corporations all have this sort of greedy kind of approach, but of course that's not true. There is lots and lots of generosity and integrity and love flowing through our corporations in many ways, th flowing through our leaders in many ways. It's not just about profit, but it's about profit, if you know what I mean. It's about profiting in the abundant ways in which love allows us to profit. It's a kind of love that heals us, that liberates us, that moves us into an abundant seeing, an abundant knowing that God is everywhere present. It's real. It's true. God is good and right here, right now. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how dire the circumstances may seem to be, you can find the spot of love or the person for, through which you want to give your joy to or you want to give your love to. And that relationship, that glue that binds the two of you together or binds you to the caring for a cause or binds you to whatever it is that you are caring about or grateful for or concerned about in the world is enough to move you out of your situation and into the abundance and the generosity and the integrity and the creativity of love. It's always available because it's God, right? <laughs> and it's most, you know, clear essence. Whenever a child asks me to explain God, I always go to love <laughs> because we all know what it feels like from the very beginning of coming into this world and probably long before coming in, we know what love feels like so we can relate to that, what it feels like to love a parent or to love even to love a toy. You know, what it feels like to have that, that feeling of connection and caring. And it is from there then that we understand that we are loved in that way and that we are a part of that field of love and that we are made to be that love in the world. So many different shades of love, so many different faces and facets of love. And that's the beauty of sort of unpacking a love, of stepping into it and feeling it and then moving it into the world, even in the most difficult of times. You know, a nice guiding question for our, li our lives is, what would love do now? Right? What would love do now? What would be the most loving act or the most loving words in this moment I could share? How could I be love in this moment? And sometimes the answer to that question is really about self-love. Did you ever notice that? It's one we forget about a lot. A lot of times we think it's all about loving on the outside, you know, all of those in our lives out here. But a lot of times it's, it's really, it's here that's needed. And it's when we give ourselves the love, when we love ourselves up or, or rest in that beautiful silence like we did that was peppered today, not with silence, but of sounds of humanity, you know, which I loved <laughs> because it was just, you know, it, it was just the sounds of, of how we move about the world and the beauty of our expressions and the diversity of who we are and the joyful sound of that child. And sometimes instead of fighting what we think should be happening, complete silence, we can just say, ah, isn't it wonderful that the presence of love is showing up in so many different ways? 
In the Christmas story, there are so many decisions that need to be made as there are in our lives all the time, right? So many pivotal decisions get made in order for that birth of the Christ consciousness to come into the world. You know, and that's what happened there. That's why we celebrate this. There's a, a breaking of a veil into a whole new kind of consciousness, a whole new kind of spiritual understanding with that Christ consciousness coming in. And so all these characters basically had to conspire to play their parts in different ways. They could have made different decisions and it still would have come out okay. <laughs> Particularly people like Herod could have made different decisions. You know about King Herod. King Herod made his decisions purely from fear and the absence of love, complete absence of love. It was out of fear that he would lose his power because he heard some great king was coming into the world. And he was afraid that he would be somehow, I imagine this was his fear, that somehow he would be, you know, dethroned in some way. And so his control, his need for control and his approach from fear was all it seems like he could see through. So when he learned the wise men came and when the wise men told him, him that they were going to welcome the Christ into the world, he wanted to know where they found the child. And he said, when you find him, come and let me know. Well, these are wise men. <laughs> so they immediately knew intuitively that bringing that news back to Herod was not a good plan. And so they didn't do that. They went back a different way to avoid that. They, you know, they were coming from the east, from other countries. And so they went back a different route. And so Herod, of course, didn't know then, where is this child Jesus? And in this extremely cruel act, he made an edict throughout the land that all boys two and under be murdered, just in case. I mean, the cruelty is hard to imagine, right? It's not something that any of us in this room could ever wrap our heads around or, or express in the world. But there are ways that, that in the world that we do create separation, Right? There are ways in the world. Has anybody ever withheld love? Anybody ever kept your love to yourself and closed off the doors of your heart because you're hurt or you're afraid of being hurt? Sure, a lot of us have. I know I have. And when we catch ourselves doing that, what we can do to open the doors back is to drop in and give ourselves, find out what we need, ask ourselves, have a little empathy. You know, if King Herod would have had the skills of, of connection practice, Carolyn, <laughs> he might have known, right, to go in and to see what am I really afraid of? What is it that I'm really needing? Maybe this would be good for my kingdom, this love that is being birthed into the world. Maybe it's not a threat to me. What is it that I'm needing? Oh, I'm feeling afraid. I see. And he could have sued that part of him that felt so afraid and made a window, an opening for true love to come forward. We always have a choice. We can always make another decision and really make a decision for love. We have that opportunity at our fingertips. We have that opportunity inside of our hearts. We just need to stop ourselves in the midst of our withholding, in the midst of our judging and blaming one another, in the midst of those kinds of words that separate us from the people that we love the most often are the ones who get this, right? And then to, to notice, maybe even if we aren't speaking it, the thoughts we might have that are separating. And every time we have those thoughts, there is an energetic separation that happens, even if we're not experiencing that in the outer. There's an energetic separation that happens within us that moves us into an absence, even though we can't ever really be in the absence of love because that would be the absence of God and God is everywhere present and love is everywhere present. But in our consciousness, we can be in that kind of space where we think we are in absence, where we think we are alone, where we think we are unloved, where we think there is no love. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> and we know, we know, because we're on this journey, you know that that's not true. We can be in a place where intellectually we absolutely know without beyond a shadow of a doubt that it can't be that there would be an absence of love, that it's not possible that we could be ever anywhere in the absence of love, that we can't be separated from this energy and this truth and this love that binds us together and that liberates us all. It's not possible. But yet, intellectually, we can know that and here in our hearts, boy, we can be in another place, right? We can be in a place of, of, of protection, like Herod. And so when we hear about these 
people who do these cruel things and we think, oh, wow, that person really missed it out, missed out. We, we can know, as we always do when we metaphysically interpret things, that every character is us. And so just because we wouldn't do something as horrible as, as Herod doesn't mean that we don't do some things, make some decisions for, out of the absence of love or the presence of fear that cause that kind of separation. And the beauty is we get to decide. We get to decide again and again and again to forgive ourselves, to move on, to give ourselves the empathy so that we can be the love that we came to be. The innkeeper had a difficult decision to make. Remember Mary and Joseph show up. Mary's very pregnant. She's about to give birth to this child. It's cold outside. It's December. Well, we don't know that it was December, but it might have been cold outside. <laughs> might have been hot outside. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but whatever it was, there they are, and they don't have a room. And, you know, I imagine that the innkeeper was kind of in that place of automatic pilot. You know how you know, you might come into an organization and they're kind of in bureaucracy mode. Do you ever get that? Where it's just like, no, we don't do that. No, we don't have any rooms. No, it's, you know, that's not possible. And they're not really paying attention. Like there's the person is not being a person <laughs> with a heart that understands and listens to the situation, that there's no room really for, for hearing or to, for paying attention. And so have you ever found yourself in that place where you're one of those people who's in the, in the mode of the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law, where you're not really paying attention to what's in front of you? And if we can drop into our hearts and we pay attention to what's here for us, we can hear and see and know and act and make decisions in a different kind of way. I wonder if that innkeeper afterwards, when he found out that they went to the barn to have the baby, I wonder if that innkeeper thought twice, had regrets. I imagine most of us would. And if we do find ourselves in that place, where do we need to go? But forgiveness, right? To know that, ah, yeah, we weren't paying attention in that moment, but we don't have to make more separation in the world by beating ourselves up and making ourselves feel more separated from love. But instead to recognize, ah, I could have made a different choice. I could have been more skillful. I could have been more attentive. And to resolve for ourselves that next time we will be. That's as simple as that, really, you know? Maya Angelou talks about love as something that, as I've mentioned a few times, that heals and liberates us. She also says that love is not a sentimental thing for her, but love is that which, which pins the stars into their heavenly positions and holds them there. Love is that which orders the blood to flow through our veins and the proper ways in which it pours through our veins. She's talking about divine love, the love that makes the world go round quite literally, the love that makes the world work, the love that reminds us that we are bound together. I love that idea that love both binds us together and liberates us all. Because it is the binding that brings us together in the kinds of connection points, Christ to Christ, divine to divine, love to, or heart to heart, soul to soul. Those are the kinds of binds and connections that we want and that we rejoice in and that we love to have in our lives, right? And then the liberation to be who we are is an act of self-love to allow other people to be who they are. You know, I was chuckling today that you all sang, Don, we now are gay apparel. And I felt like I was kind of wearing gay apparel today. <laughs> and I am gay, so I thought that was funny too. <laughs> and I'm glad that this is a place that welcomes all of us, right? And all of our different expressions, right? In fact, we, we relish our diversity, don't we? This is a place that relishes that, that really enjoys the fact that we come with different backgrounds and different preferences and different ways of showing up and expressing love in the world. And here at Unity, we say, welcome. Thank you for coming and bringing your unique perspective. Love liberates us. So love is all these things and more. And in the Christmas story, we also have Joseph who has to make this really difficult decision. You know, he's in a place where it's pretty embarrassing. You know, whoop, Mary's pregnant and we're not married. And, 
you know, and so what does he do about that? You know, and the times are very different then too. I mean, this is kind of the age old thing that still happens today, but the times change with us, right? And so he has to make a decision. What would be the most honorable thing to do? The most honorable thing for Mary, the most honorable thing for him. And I, I have a sense that he really was coming from a genuine place when he thought maybe the best thing to do would be to sort of just kind of slip out and let Mary be with her family and kind of just, just let himself disappear in a way. And then he had a dream. And God told him in the dream, the dream was clearly a divinely led dream that said, oh, no, no, you're meant to be with Mary and you're meant to be the father of this child. And so because he was a kind of guy that followed guidance, he now had, and it's really what he wanted anyway. You know, in his heart of heart, that's what he wanted. But society was putting the pressure on in a different kind of way. And so he was making a decision from that left brain place, that intellectual place that said, well, this is the right thing to do. And so then that's when he got the guidance that said, no, 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 go this way. And so he did. He followed the star like the wise men did, you know, follow that, that magnetizing power of love that says, this is the truth. We know that in our hearts, right? We can feel that when something is true and alive and real for us. We can feel the purity of love when it's there. We can feel that sense of loving something so much. I remember when I was a child, I always remember this moment when I was holding this wild bunny and I just, I loved it so much. I had to give it to someone else because I was afraid I was just going to squeeze it too hard, you know? Or I remember having these bursts of love, like for my sister or my father, just like loving them so much that my heart just felt like, you know, it was just overflowing. Do you ever have those moments? Yeah, and so what a, what a joy that is when we have those experiences where our love just spills over and we can just relish and wait and pause in that moment and feel the presence of the divine and make a decision that we will stay open so we can continue to have those kinds of amazing experiences of divine love. Mary had a big decision to make too, of course. Here comes an angel telling her this preposterous news that she's going to have this child. This child is going to change the world. Mary comes from a humble place. She's a young woman. And, she, and in um, early Jude Jewish teachings, when you say the Holy Spirit's going to come into somebody, that happens to important people. And so for her in the society, it was like, I'm not worthy for it to be one of those people that the Holy Spirit's going to come into. But she was so open and so willing to always follow her guidance that she just said yes. And so she did. And she followed this, this truth. And then she, she sang the, um, the song. Well, actually, this child in Sunday school said that when Mary, uh, you know how kids sometimes get the words a little bit confused. And this kid said that when, when Mary found out she was going to give birth to Jesus, she sang the Magna Carta. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it was a little bit later. <laughs> it's the Magnifica. Magni yeah. Did I say that right? No. Mag yeah. Magnificata. That's right. Magnificat. Yeah. Magnificat. Anyway, so we've got glad that behind us. <laughs> but the point is, in that song or in those words, she's praising. She's giving thanks. She's opening her. You know, what Mary does, basically, is she makes space. And that's really what we're asked to do, is make space for the divine. So she makes space, literally, in her physical being, but in her heart. She makes space in her soul. She makes space to bring forth divine love, Christ consciousness, into the world. And you know we are asked to do that every day, all day long, every time we're faced with a decision. We're asked to make space for God, make space for love, make space for the possibility of this to be birthed right now, in this place, in this consciousness, in our work, in this community. Constantly that is available to us. And we can be like Herod and be stingy and be withholding and be judgmental and blaming and separating. Or be like the innkeeper and be like an automatic pilot, not really paying attention to anything around us but our own stuff that needs to be done or whatever it is that we think is so important. Or we could be like Mary and say, I will make space. 
I will make space in my life. I will make space right now in my time. I will make space right now in, in whatever it is to be here, to be now, because this couldn't be more important. I don't really understand it. She didn't really know what was going to, be, going to happen, which is all the more amazing, right? Because there's not a sense of, well, this will happen and this will happen and Mary will walk you through steps A through B and we'll get you a coach and we'll get you a social service person and we'll, you know, no. <laughs> you're just a young woman in early times and you're showing up pregnant and you gotta make space for it. You gotta figure it out. And she does. And it's a great uh, showing for us of how we too can, can do this. We too can do this in the most difficult of times. We can make the decision for love. We can show up for love. And so I know that as we do, as we make a decision for love, as you do, as you make decisions for love, the things open up for you in amazing ways, that abundance comes and that creativity comes and that generosity shows up and forgiveness shows up and healing happens and liberation happens. Who knows, you know, what, if you say yes to love, if you make space for love, if you make a decision today for love, who knows what, what will be healed? Maybe you. What heart could be healed? What life could be liberated? Maybe yours. And maybe more. Who knows? But we're on this fabulous journey together, aren't we? When we say yes to how fabulous the journey is of being guided and allowing ourselves to say yes and to make space for love, there's no telling what will happen. You may be asked, in fact, you are being asked to make space and to birth the Christ consciousness on the earth right now. Maybe Santa will show up on Christmas Eve and ask you to guide the sleigh. Could happen. All the other reindeer will love you. <laughs> Truly, though, my hope for all of us reindeer is that we make the decision to love. That's it, isn't it? Just say yes and make the decision to love. And watch how out of the private landscape of your own heart, life pours and love pours and universal love then lands all across the land and connects us and binds us together once again and liberates us. Let's make that decision together and let's speak it and affirm it together in song with this song by Daniel Neymar called Love Is My Decision. Mm -hmm.